Say hello to everyone. Hey, Paul the Trombone is here. We're live at Allegra Music Academy in Tarzana with the virtuosic trombonist Bob McChesney. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, music and share some of his information. So it, feel free to just comment and if you have any questions, and we'll try to get to everyone's questions as soon as possible. All right? All right, so let's take it away. Thanks, Paul, and uh, I'd like to thank Allegra Music for having me here today. And and uh, please write in with any questions you have. And I started out with the standard, uh, all the things you are. Uh, I think one thing that's really important when you're playing jazz and learning how to play jazz is that you be able to play in such a way that if the rhythm section dropped out, 
you can still hear all the chords. That's called playing inside the changes. For example, on all the things you are, if I was to play over the changes on the first couple chords, you might play something like this. Right? Just a pretty melody, which is great. But the skill that we have to learn to combine with that kind of playing is outlining the chords. So you want to be able to play the scales and the chords and when the chord changes, connecting to chord tones. So this is something that I work with my students all the time on. So I may play something like uh, from the F minor to the B, to the B flat minor. See, I'm hitting the D flat right when the B flat minor comes up so that that makes it clear the chord is changing. And proceed to play that chord or scale. See, I keep targeting one of the chord tones each time the chord changes and then switching to that chord scale sound. So that's something that I try to get all my students to work with. Um, uh, playing the two fives, outlining, chord arpeggiating, things like that, as well as playing melodies over the chords that we hear. So I try to do uh, both of those things. Beautiful. So I just, that's a great standard that Joan, Jerome Kern wrote, and I like playing it. So, so what types of uh, devices did you use to work on that as far as hitting those chord tones and, and slowing down the process? What did you do to get into those tonalities? Well, the first thing is I don't practice with the track going or a metronome going. I like to work on things really slowly. I might put the changes up in front of me on the music stand and just try to find lines that make sense to me and take my time. And then and that, that'd be one way of doing it. Another way would be to take um, a particular chord pattern or lick or structure and try to apply that to every single chord as it goes by. Like when you're first learning a tune, you're trying to get it in your ear. I might have the student play one, two, three, one on, on every chord. Like, Something like simple like that, or, or an arpeggio as a, as, a, as a variation on that. That kind of thing. And, but I'm not doing it uh, trying to keep up with anything. So I might, it might take me a minute to find that chord because it's new to me. So I'm going to just sit there and work on it at my own pace. Uh, and when I feel like I might, I might even spend a week on something like that on a new tune and then try to play it along with the track to see how I'm doing as far as assembling language over over time. So that's really, for me, it's really a big deal to work without without a uh, without a net, without, without a band playing next to you or a track or whatever, but really trying to explore the harmony. Then when I get comfortable at that, it's just so much easier for me to, it, it makes much more sense to try to assemble something after that. So Okay, cool. There's a lot of questions about your horn right now, what you're playing. Oh, I'm playing right Today, I'm playing a uh, Bach 12. It's pretty much, a, it's got a stock pipe and it's probably, this bell's probably from the 70s and the slide too. And uh, a Bach uh, 7C mouthpiece with a screw-on rim that Bob Reeves did for me. It's just an 11C. Again, those are some different stock parts, but they're all mixed together. So it's a 7C with an 11C rim and uh, 500 bore Bach 12 trombone. They have a great, the thing that's so cool about the Bach I mean, all, horn, all horns can be great, right? Every trombone is terrific. But what I like about them, what guys in the studios really liked about them out here in LA, was that you can kind of darken them up and sound kind of classical and legit on them. Or you can crank them up and sound bright, and they, they're real steerable into the kinds of kinds of situation. You know, they, they are real adaptable, and you can kind of steer the tone. And it stuck with me for a while. I've, I've played Kings and Bachs, and I've had some Hansons and everything, but this seems to be, you know, a really cool, cool way of being able to steer the sound into a studio thing or a jazz. It's adaptable. Thing. It's a really warm, you know. I like I, all trombones have great characteristics, but this one is pretty darn steerable from the legit thing to the jazz. Thing. A lot of people want you to play a little more. Oh, is that what's happening? Okay. Yeah. Should uh, let me just play something a acapella then. Okay. So I'll do some free noodling. Yeah.
about your abilities, your, your ability to play so controlled at such a quiet volume with still such a full sound, almost like someone just put the volume level down on a radio, but the core of the sound is still there. Uh, gotten any tips about how to get that together? Well, I have to think about that for a second, because a lot of what I do in my sound is sort of just natural to what I, I hear, and I'm always working on it. I, I wish it was like you say how soft it is. I almost wish it was louder so it would cut, cut more with less effort. But when I try to push the trombone when I'm crossing partials, I get a, a rougher kind of a tone. It's kind of an aggressive trombone sound that a lot of people like. But I try to, I always try to make it cleaner. So I, 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 I sense myself backing off a lot and maybe doing this over the years, trying to make a clarity over volume. Can you tell us the difference? Ad, you're ad, sure. Accuracy over volume is, is what uh, you know, Bill Watchers talks about that all the time, too. It's like uh, you do need to be heard, but at the same time, you, how, much, how much accuracy do you want to sacrifice? So if I'm going to play, let me, let me just maybe do a major scale in a few different ways or something like mm -hmm. that. So if I, the sound probably just comes from in my head listening to greats like Freddie Hubbard and guys that I've you know, studied on other instruments. But the softness comes from probably just trying to be clean, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. So if I played something as clean as possible at a low volume, it would be like probably like this. <laughs> start pushing the volume louder, which I can do, doodle tonguing does, itself does not inhibit the volume. You can play it louder. It, doodle, you can doodle very loud. You can doodle very loud. It's just the, the playing will get messier. Let me try to push the volume a little bit. Pushing keys, they're not. They do tongue notes, but 
it, the note doesn't have a huge diff character change between the notes. So I see. I tried to match it. Trombone, why is trombone so tough, right? Because if we don't tongue every note, you're going to smear. Unless we have a crossing. So what do we, most trombone, trombonists have to single tongue every note and that's too slow, right? Mm -hmm. First, when you get up faster, it gets, some people can single tongue very fast when it's faster, it tends to get a harsher kind of a, an effect. So what about double tonguing and, and um, triple tongue? Taka, 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 ta, taka, 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 That sounds too harsh. It's great for, for detached kind of playing, but because the fronts of the notes are accented and then there's a decay on the note, it doesn't work as good for legato. And doodle tonguing, the, the notes appear to be long. And they sound much more like a vowel being pushed or a key being depressed. So and how much of how much of are you using the natural breaks of the the, the horn versus your articulations? You you use the natural breaks of the horn? Yes, and I, and, and I think it's the same system that I hear Carl Fontana when Carl Fontana played. He played. It's a system of doodle tonguing in the same partial or ascending. So I'd be going da 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 da, -da always using my tongue on every note. So when I'm in the same partial or ascending, but on the way down, I have to take natural slurs and they're always preceded by consonants, like da ah da ah da ah, or la ah la ah la ah. So I might have a, a line like, mm. try to make all the transitions sound the same, but I'm not tonguing this the same way. I'm going da 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 da. So it's different depending on where the breaks are. I see. How the solos are set up. Just as a piano player has to choose what fingers they would play to execute a line. Yeah. Well, a doodle tonguing trombonist has to select syllables that accommodate that particular passage mm. and phrase. So is it mm. easy to sight read something with doodle tonguing? No, it's really difficult. You have to kind of figure out where the partials are and then it mm. comes together really quickly so it's really a hindrance to, to sight reading I see but it because in jazz improvisation we're assembling patterns and licks and, and harmonic shapes that we practiced tens of thousands of times before those syllables are already in place in your mind and you don't even think about it it's just how you play that particular scale and and you just kind of get used to playing could I play someone else's solo with doodle tongue yes after I've worked on it but initially, no, the doodle tonguing has to be felt where those breaks are. It's only because of the breaks. If you could just doodle tongue straight up and down, then you wouldn't have to worry about it. I, I could demonstrate that. That doesn't seem to work for me. Why can't you just doodle right down? Well, it sounds mushy, I'll demonstrate. What? Well, if I slur it, and then just straight doodling. It's hard for me to even demonstrate because I'm so not used to it. Uh -huh. I'm like, but I'm not setting up each break with a with a, a consonant like sounds better than it's mushy, but da 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 It's much clearer it's sound. Clear, it's cleaner. So this is something that anybody can learn to do, really. I have a book called, I, I have a copy of it with me, the, the um, doodle, doodle Studies and Etudes. Oh yeah, that's a life changer book. That's the 90s. It's right there. And, keep bringing it closer. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. That's the one. You can get it on your website, right? Yep. And, it's, and it, it, it'll explain the whole thing from beginning to end and has tons of exercises for each of those types of different downward partial changes, whatever rhythm they happen to fall in. That's BobMcChesney.com, no space in between? Yep. Okay. And uh, I have another book that has um, some doodle tonguing oh, yeah, synopsized in it, but it has a lot of uh, technical exercises yeah. for getting your chops together. I use that and one a lot. slide movement. That's, oh, that brings up another thing, Paul. Yeah. When I work with my students, I have a... Um, I recognize immediately why their legato sounds rough, and I can fix it pretty quickly. What what they what I have what I notice in their playing is that their bell is shaking when they're moving their arm back and forth. 
because they're using, there's so much forearm moving back and forth. You see the horn jerking like this. If you see your bell moving when you are moving the slide, that means you're moving your chops and your head and everything. And that, even though they may be doodle tonguing correctly, they get this rough tone because the wrist is stiff. Let me mm -hmm. demonstrate, if you, if you were to play a line and use your wrist, it barely, dis it does disrupt the air, but just the tiniest little bit. But if you're using a stiff wrist, that means the forearm has to make the full motion back and forth. Mm -hmm. Let me do it the right way. Now I'll stiffen my wrist and I'll try to tongue it and blow the same exact way. Because your, your head and your mouthpiece and everything is shaking, you may not even be aware of it. Just those direction changes, you're adding the mass of your forearm to the weight of the slide. And when you shift direction, there's a little bump, and that's what makes the legato sound rough. So that's why I do that one little parlor trick where it actually sounds better not to move the slide than to have a stiff wrist. You know, you go. Now, if I try to move the slide perfectly with my wrist stiff, it's, it's better to ghost them. <laughs> so I try to play the right positions, but I also am very aware that I cannot shake the main section of the horn. It has to be as stable as possible. And one of the ways that I do this, and I, I teach this to my students, it might be a little bit radical for some, you know, some classical studios, but I find that when I, if I have to make a move, I can take my, I'm able to take my thumb off the, the brace and reach out with my fingers. If I keep my thumb on, it forces me to have to move my forearm more. So if I'm going two to five, you hear that jerk in the, mm -hmm. if I move, if I take my thumb off and look, my forearm is not barely moving an inch. exercises in the technical studies book where you practice moving from one position to the other opening and closing wow. and then you practice moving th three positions close close open close close so the first position out you practice opening your fingers up for and not moving the forearm very much nice. the longer fingers you have you want to hold the slide right on the last digit at the bottom of the two so you can really reach if I'm holding at the top of the two more forearm is needed to get out there to fit. So it just, you want, this is something that you can feel naturally if you, I think many players who play really well, who haven't had an articulation style like doodle tonguing where they can go really fast, their slide work is adequate until they try this to play faster. So now they learn doodle tonguing and whoops, they're still doing everything with a stiff wrist. You really have to, it goes along with learning how to articulate faster not shaking the horn. So okay. I call it the multiple slide grips or you know, variable slide grip. So you might might open just a little bit for third, second and third, and then fourth is a little more fifth. And I don't use it in sixth or seventh because it just feels kind of awkward and I might drop the slide. Mm. But not too many of us are playing things really fast, moving back and forth around sixth position. So if you ever watched the great Carl Fontana, yeah, he never got too much past third position when he played solo. So, I see. you know, if you can accommodate fourth and fifth this way with the variable grip. So I would, I suggest take it slow and, and just gently, you know, try a little bit. Don't open up all at once the first week. Give this a few weeks and, and practice doing just a few moves faster and faster. <laughs> Those are situations when you're reversing that really can jerk the horn, right? Mm -hmm. Same direction, real smooth. No problem, but that's when we really need that variable grip. So if I'm, hard, if I'm out in fifth and I know I'm coming in, you have to predict where you're going, right? I'll start with my thumb back, and then bring it in. If I'm, if I'm in and I'm going out, I start close. And if the note's in the middle, you stay close. 
articulation that makes the trombone so difficult and, and can make it sound so good. But there's 20% of it is you got you got to have this grip so you don't upset. You might be doing it right and you're going, well, I'm not getting that smooth. And it's because it's probably that last 20%, you got to smooth out the motions, you know, mm -hmm. so the forearm doesn't move that much. That's it. Well, we got someone asking about doodling over intervals larger than a third. You got any advice on that? Um, I just think that, well, the instrument gets harder. So anything that's harder for the chops is going to be harder to execute, mainly because of the chops. But anything upward, I'm going to use the syllables da a la la, da 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 la, da 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 da. So if I'm going up, I guess I'm more likely to miss it with my lips. It's, it's not an issue with the tongue, it's an issue of the accuracy of your hair and your lips mm -hmm. and trying to get all that way. On the way down, I would, I'm going to set up each break with a consonant. Chops aren't set right. I'm not pre-hearing it and I'm not locked in. Not the, the syllables seem just to do nothing but help. So having those syllables there on the way up aids in the crossing, helps you to not miss the note. On the way down, having a consonant before the break helps to make that clear. And, and doing a pure slur now gives the tongue a rest and it and it's less interfering. Uh, when you, you can tongue down or partial changes. But there's less interference, and it's easier to just let the natural slur go when you're playing a rope shoe, right? Da da da. You would slur that. I can tongue it, but it's just sort of like yikes. Got to be careful that that isn't placed exactly right. It's just a lot more work to try and not mess it up. So I use natural downward slurs when they follow consonants mm. when you're trying to play fast like that. My other concept is just to try to practice everything, all your mechanical stuff that you're playing, your scales and everything. Play them expressively like you're playing to a young kid, you know, so that it sounds clean and, and, and beautiful and melodic. A lot of us get all trapped up in, in uh, the technique of, you know, like posture and am I breathing correctly and am I doing this and there's so many things going on in your head, you forget you're just trying to express a, a pretty melody you just want to be able to play something that sounds nice and isn't too harsh. So I base most of my playing on just trying to sound attractive and pretty on, on the trombone. Mm. It's, a, it's a pretty amazing instrument in the way we can express pitch and, and everything. And if we get the articulation together, you do just about everything on this thing. What advice do you give to people just starting out, like real beginners on the instrument? Uh, your base, you know, well, first of all, you have to play your instrument every day. You know, you can't skip days. Oh, look, I missed yesterday, so I'll play twice as long tomorrow. It doesn't, it doesn't work. You really want to play every day a little bit, and you want to get all of the basics together. You want to, get, you want to listen. You try to get a private teacher to, to direct you in the right direction. You can do it yourself, but with someone watching you closely. You can correct a lot of mistakes right off the bat. You can kind of uh, get further quicker if you're not making too many mistakes. And you want to do ba you want to practice basic technique, good steady airstream, quick slide movements without jerking at the last minute, proper tonguing. You know, exercises. Um, just uh, the basics really of the trombone have to be learned. It's a it's a much slower starter instrument than uh, than uh, saxophone of the slide, you know. You know, violin is a hard start too, but look what look what it's capable of when you're if you just give it, you know, you're patient, you just give it some time. 
So the basics, mm -hmm. blowing, long tones, tonguing, slurring, working out of books, having yeah. fun. It's got to, you, you're going to keep your enthusiasm up if it's fun all the time, right? Well, what's you a mean, good book for a beginner? I think I started, I think, Jesus, it's been a while now, but I had this thing called the Bellwin Band Builder. Or, do you remember those? Yeah. And then Rubank, those are really Those are my books. favorite, Rubank. Really great stuff. And little songs to play right away. So you're not, okay, you're not ready to play music yet. You know, like they have you playing fun stuff. And I just remember doing that and getting a long way with it. Listening to music. You can't, it's okay to listen to pop music, but if you don't listen to music that, uh, I'm not saying necessarily tribal music, but music from wind, wind instruments, jazz, and things that you really want to learn how to sound better on your instrument. If you're in a big band, you got to listen to some big band music. If you're in a concert band, you should listen to concert band music. And, and that really helps shape your sound on your instrument because you know, you're not guessing what it sounds like. You can hear the recordings of the greatest players doing it. Our minds are made that way. We're vacuums and we hear that and go, oh, you know exactly how to play it now. Mm -hmm. Listening, huge part of it. Playing, listening, and then Practicing the technical stuff. Got anything else for him? Yeah, anybody got any questions? Shoot them off. I'm going to look through some of these. So maybe uh, you can noodle on the horn while I get some questions ready. Okay. See if there's any questions. Uh, if, you, if you guys aren't familiar with pentatonic scales, it's something I like to use a lot. You got to be careful not to overuse them. But pentatonics, when you superimpose them over other chord roots, that you're playing uh, upper structure and much more interesting notes than when you're playing whole scale. Well, what so is a pentatonic scale? Oh, a pentatonic scale is any five note scale. But the one, the ones that jazz players use the most are like starting with the, the major, which is one, two, three, five, six in any major key. And then you can alter some of those notes to fit other chord sounds. So like in C, you play C, D, E, G, A, one, two, three, five, six. I was singing the wrong key, but here it is. But I wouldn't necessarily play that over a C chord. I might play that in a different place, like over an F chord, or, or over a D minor, or, or a D sus chord. Hmm. So that's where they sound really beautiful. Interesting. Of, so, I'll play D minor for a second. Mm. So they're just, it's just a way of finding more interesting note relationships and not trying to sound mechanical, I'm just trying, trying to sound like I'm floating above the inside sound of the chord. I like playing inside a chord. If you say play on C major and you want it to sound really down home, you're going to play chord tones, roots, thirds, fifths, sevenths. Playing, kind of emphasizing the under part of the chord, but the upper structure part of the chord is. When you play, if I was going to play on C major, I play the G pentatonic. Over this. It gives it like a really mm. open, pretty sound. It's just mm -hmm, colors cool. that I like. I think works really well with the trombone, especially an instrument that's harder to get around on. But if you're playing those beautiful upper structure tones on, on, on an instrument like this, it, uh, I just think it sounds beautiful. And it's very easy to do, too. Uh, pentatonics, a five note scale, is really easy to learn. Maybe mathematically, it's it's a uh, hundred times easier to learn than a major scale. There's just not that many intervals and things to practice, so you learn them really quickly. So, what are you are you uh, just kind of do you learn some patterns off the bat to, or how do you yes. get into the tonality? I would, I would say at first I would have everyone play the modes of the scale, and a mode of the scale is let's just play that's let's play C pentatonic from C to C, and then I would do it from D to D, the same notes. Uh -huh. I'll demonstrate that for a minute. So the modes of the pentatonic scale. Yeah. Sorry. 
Same chords, uh, same, same tones. Those are the same five uh -huh. tones, but it doesn't have a, it has a different characteristic, right? It has right. A sound. So just like the modes of the major scale, these have a, a different characteristics. So E to E. So that's the modes, then I would do it in thirds. Brilliant, man. Oh, yeah. That's brilliant. I never thought of it that way, like working them like modes. That's cool. It's just, it's just <laughs> you can do two, okay, how about three notes at a time? When you're first learning scales, breaking things down into real small pieces, your brain picks up those little chunks really fast and you can put it all together. Yeah. As opposed to trying to run the whole scale, you can say to yourself, three notes or two notes. Well, so let's do three notes. See, I'm doing just three notes at a time. See. Or I could do incremental practicing, like. You know, just adding a note right. at a time, kind of thing. So, in just generally speaking, if you saw like a C major chord, you just go up a fifth and use that G pentatonic scale. Um, yep, yeah, that's that, one place. Of course, uh -huh. there's like six or eight places that skip. But when you know the scale, it's really easy to find where it fits. I could run through all the technical places those would fit. Like uh, there's a know, lot, huh? Well, well, <laughs> first of all, uh, that's a, the C major pentatonic is what Jerry Berganza called the A minor pentatonic. So it works on A minor seven. Oh. It works on. Uh, uh, D sus. You just go to the relative. Uh, relative, major, the relative. Minor. And uh, there, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. You can play outside the key, half step away with those So you learn to apply these in as many places as possible, so they're very yeah. multidimensional in all situations. And then I, when I work on a tunes, for example, when I talked about learning tunes earlier, um, I'm just working off the music stand. Hmm, I wonder where I could apply pentatonics here, here, here. And you force it in. And why am I doing that? Because I. Want to sound like Mr. Pentatonic? No, I, I'm trying to open up my ear because we all want to just kind of play by ear when we solo. We just want to relax and, and make up some great ideas. But but my ear can't hear that stuff fast enough. So mm -hmm. by forcing it in, I'm going, oh wow, that sounds cool. And I'm learning to hear new things that I could not hear if I was just trying to keep up with the band and mm -hmm. play things I already know. This is a way of opening your ears up to new sounds. What about over a dominant chord? Where would you incorporate a pentatonic? I, I use the altered pentatonic, so I'm going to get to that in one second. Okay. Sorry. Okay, uh, so that was just uh, modes and thirds, right? How about a pattern, like a four note pattern? So I go up four notes and I go to the next scale, so I'm going to do the same thing. Is it, see what I'm doing? Yeah. And, that, and I, can, I can play them down like. Yeah. It's like the classic major scale pattern everyone learns, but okay. it applied to that. That's a good one. There's one left that I'm doing. Remember, these just don't play over C. They're going to fit over other colors. So uh -huh. It's really quite modern and nice. You so don't overuse them. Man. How do you know, though, where do you apply them? You just kind of trial and error? Well, you, I, you can look it up or... Uh, you can try them, yeah, if you sit at the piano and play that scale and, and then try every every single root in the scale. Okay. Major, minor, minor seven, flat five. Try where they work. Okay, so what do I play on a dominant? If you if you alter this pentatonic by flatting one of the notes, I'll start out with the first one. I call it the flat three pentatonic. I'm gonna flat the third note, the E flat. So you practice it the same way, right? Modes, thirds, whatever. It comes really quick now because you already learned the other one. Uh -huh. That I would play over F7, F9. Have you had an F blues? Okay. I'm going to... Oh, okay. You just alter the one note. This is the third. Right. Wow. So, I'm not thinking, so it becomes... It's technical at first, but after a while it goes, hey, that's, that sounds like F9 to me. I just kind of... Can play it without thinking about it, just like the doodle tonguing. When you force yourself at first to 
to hear these new sounds, it's awkward. And then through repetition, you go, hey, that just feels nice on that chord. And just, I don't even, oh yeah, I guess it's a pentatonic, I guess. I don't know. And uh, you don't play pentatonics constantly. You want to use chromatic passing notes and all the colors that are avail available to you. But this is a way to quickly sound super hip on mm -hmm. a chord. I love you say it. F9, everyone's normally home base, right? Yeah, it's a mix of linear, right? Yep, that, that, exactly. So, but if I jump to C minor. I'm highlighting 13. And so you're going C, D, or C, E flat? C, D, E flat. C, D, one, two, E flat. Three, five, six. G, A, C. Yep. One, two, three. It's a flat three in this case. Five, six. That also fits B altered. Hmm. B altered because the tri -tone away you're, from you're the... playing melodic minor on yeah. when you play B7 altered. So. so C minor. See how that fits over that sound, mm -hmm. that chord sound? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it fits A minor 7 flat 5. sound on A minor 7 flat 5. So you're not playing. I'm getting, I'm getting around quicker, right? Yeah. I'm skipping over more notes. Cool sound. Um, Let me ask you something. What Phrygian. About, what about for people that are, don't know their chords or whatever? You Have you done a lot of transcribing of solos or listen, what is the... Let's say somebody knows and know their chords, but they want to learn how to improvise. What, what 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 do you recommend for that? Well, I I listen to a lot of music and I did transcribe whole solos, but to become to get develop your own voice on the instrument, I think the uh, this is what I recommend: transcribing just those little licks or patterns that your favorite players play in certain places. That way, when when you listen to a record, you're going to hear, oh, I like that, and I like that. Yeah, that was cool, but I really like. So over, over 10 years time, you pick a whole different selection of lines than you, and it, it starts to become part of your, we all bark, share from each other, right? And that's how music and we all grow together. But your growth is gonna be slightly different in the directions and because of the choices that you made to pick out the lines. So, but your other part of the, so I, so I recommend transcribing licks versus whole solos. Yes, you can learn, how to notate, how to hear better. It's good to write out whole solos once in a while. It's a good skill. But that skill is not how to improvise and get your own voice. Getting your own voice to me is take the little things that you really like. Oh, wow. I remember, you know, Kenny Garrett playing something and I just wrote, keep a little book of them. You write it on, mm. you write the chord symbol and you practice it. And so then you transcribe one leg that you like, then what do you do? I try to, I, again, when, I, when that tune is on the, the music stand, I try to see Hey, I wonder if that'll fit here. Where will it, like my pentatonics, where, where can I put those in? Where can I put the lick in that I'm working on? And I try to work on just a few things at a time. You don't want to have 500 things trying to go in. It's like a, your brain's like a computer keyboard. You want to input really simply and clearly one thing at a time and then let the process work on it. Mm. And then get rid, okay, good, I got that down. And then you move on to something else and you work on that really hard. And you, and you have fun. A lot of patients, jazz musicians, sit alone a lot and work on stuff. It's more, but we enjoy it. Like if you, if you talk to great players, and Eddie Daniels, you know, told me one time he says, "I, I just like practicing." Shows. You know, people, you know, people say, "Oh, you know, that's that's the, the toiling away." And he says, "No, that's what I look forward to. That I like playing." You know, mm -hmm. so we have to learn to really love playing like that. Okay, about the chords, you have to learn to arpeggiate all your chords. I would start, a younger player that's starting to get into jazz, I would have them play the major triads in every key. So it's, it's a C major, just the three notes. You could go up and down, it's fine. You could go up in half steps or up in the cycle of fifths, it doesn't matter really right now. Like you gotta learn these notes. And we make mistakes at first, right? The idea is try not to make the same mistake twice. Correct. A great musician knows how to get better faster. Just never repeat those mistakes more than once or twice. Try to correct yourself right away. 
take your time, always start slow, until that, ooh, that frustration of not knowing, that you're supposed to have that. That means you're learning something new. We have to learn to live with that. Mm. And that has to dissipate as we practice. So two things have to happen to get better. Ooh, the frustration of not knowing, and then watching that frustration diminish as you repeat and get better and better. If you don't have those two things, what are you doing? You're just playing to listen to yourself. You're not, you're not getting any better. Ooh, check me out today, check me out. You, know, you have to delve into these uh, you know, slightly uncomfortable. You don't want to get in way over your head. Just try something slightly new that feels a little awkward and get rid of that awkwardness through repetition. So try it. Right, up mm -hmm. and down, down and up. Uh, major, uh, minor triads. And then maybe the seventh chord. We have to be able to arpeggiate these chords. Minor seven flat five. Okay, you're gonna go up and down, down and up. These are like the real basics. When you become an artist, you're gonna choose the kind of things you want to practice. But I think initially, there's certain things that every jazz musician should be able to do, and that's arpeggiate the basic chord sounds that we play. After you've accomplished that, I, I really urge you to, because music is such a vast field, go off in the direction you want to go. But initially, because you know, we're not trying to make each other sound, we're not trying to make everyone sound the same. Mm -hmm. But these basic things at this level are important to know. You know, how, you know, you know I, I can think of a hundred examples of that. But. So that, I would do the, uh, the main chords you order page here are major, major, major seventh, major nine, major, and you can do the extensions or you can repeat the octave. So you can play two ways, right? <laughs> See, I play the same thing in both octaves, mm -hmm. or I can do go to the extensions. Oh. What was going on there? I played the nine sharp eleven and thirteen above the major seven. Okay. Those are the notes. When you play the piano, you see it's good to play piano too to learn where all these these chords are. You're playing a C, E, G, and a B on the piano. The notes in between your fingers that you didn't play that are in the scale. They call those the extensions or the upper structure. Those are what I'm playing after I play the other chords. I put them up on top. Okay, so you don't do it in the lower octave, only when you get past the first octave. So in minor, you do the same thing two ways. That's without the extensions. That's repeating the same octave. Now the extensions. And playing the upper structure on the chord. Nice. You don't want to just do it that way only because when you're playing in the upper register, you may want to have access to the main part of the chord, right? The thirds and fifths. Mm -hmm. So you want to play, you want to practice both ways. Then you need to know the scales. Then you need to know, when you know a scale, right? It's the modes, thirds, scale tone triads, scale tone sevenths. What are scale tone triads, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to play C major, right? I'm going up and one, down the other, and you really, when you learn a scale as a jazz musician, it's not the same as when you're in school and they say, Oh, good! You played your scale. You need your scale. You just played it up once, right? We have to take these things apart uh -huh. so that we have access. So I'm playing along on a song that's in C major. <laughs> that's moving scale wise, right? This is thirds, and this is this is with the triad sound. C major playing those different yeah. chords in the scale. So you have to practice that. That takes a little while. Real, a lot of people asking about your range, like developing the upper register. Yeah. Um, I have a few exercises for that. Uh, the main thing about playing uh, any brass instrument, especially, 
especially noticeable on the trombone that you don't play the low register, the upper register, the same way you play the low register. You hear a lot of young students trying to play in the upper register with the same airstream and embouchure setting that they're playing in the middle register and the low register. And you hear that telltale stressed sound when they get up high, right? Mm -hmm. I hope this is helpful, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna play like the wrong way, which you tend to hear if you're not doing it right. You know that kind of sound where it's stressy? It's a little what hairy. I did, what I didn't do is I didn't, I didn't make my aperture smaller and make the air go faster when I played higher. So when you play low, you're aiming the air more at the middle of the mouthpiece, at the hole. And you're using a slower air stream that's warmer. Oh, the air doesn't move very fast. But as I play higher, it's exactly the opposite of that. I'm going to aim the air down into the cup and speed it up so that the, the air may actually be aimed down at my chin here when I'm actually playing a high B flat. And hardly any air is passing between the lips. It's very small. However, did you notice the volume of the two notes that we hear? It's just as loud, even though I'm only using a tiny little bit of air. Mm -hmm. The mistake the younger player is using is to try to play with all that air and push it through and force it through to play in the upper register. So what I recommend you practice is slurring into the upper register and playing softer as you go up, making like an aperture on the camera. You want to get that to dial down. And then you can build up the strength and the volume later. So when I'm, when I'm playing up there, it's just just tiny, you know how this is, it's a very mm -hmm. tiny amount of air goes through. And uh, in the low register, oh, you, you're, you're also, you're, you're, your, lip, your bottom lip may curl under, right? So the air goes down more into the cup. And the lower, oh, straight ahead. Mm -hmm. So this has to become natural. So you're not thinking about it. It just, uh, through practicing uh, slurring into, into the different registers. A lot of stuff in my technical studies book about that. Yeah, their uh, Facebook's about to kick us off in about 10 minutes. Uh, let's Any look questions? at those books uh, real quick. I just want to remind everyone to check them out. We got the, your uh, technical tech, studies, technical studies, and then your doodle tonguing book. Doodle studies and A tunes, it's called. Yeah. So uh, it's most excellent. This. Hey everybody, this broadcast will be archived on the Paul the Trombonist page so you can share it even after it's live if you want to go back and review any content. Uh, we'll close it out here um, maybe with another tune or play, some, play a little bit more. Okay. Any requests? <laughs> any requests? <laughs> Stella by Starlight. Yeah, okay. Stella. <laughs> Beautiful, Bob. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, thanks, for watching, and thanks, Allegro Music Academy. If you're in uh, Los Angeles area, that's the place you're going to want to go for music knowledge. It's in Tarzana. It's the best. You'll have a, you will not be disappointed with that place. 
And uh, thank you all so much, and you have a great evening. You take care. Bye-bye.